Life as a marketer was a relentless race, but I was good at it, really good. My name's Lucy, and by the time I hit 33, I had nailed down almost everything I'd set my sights on, including buying my own place. Only a couple of payments left and the apartment would officially be mine. No time for slowing down, though, not even for romance. That is, until I bumped into Jack. Jack was one of those rare guys who seemed to have popped right out of some dreamy fiction, where chivalry wasn't dead. We met at a local coffee shop, both of us reaching for the last blueberry muffin. He let me have it, but not without securing my number as a trade-off. Smart guy. From then on, it was like a fast-forward montage from a movie. Dates flowed into weekends away, and gifts started appearing on my doorstep, nothing extravagant, but always thoughtful. He had this knack for remembering things I mentioned in passing, my favorite author, that I loved tulips over roses, or how I preferred my coffee. It wasn't long before I was head over heels. And his attachment to his mom? I admired it. He'd call her every day, made sure she had everything she needed. She's my queen, he'd say, and I saw it as a sign of his loyalty and love. A guy who treated his mom like royalty was bound to treat his wife like a queen, right? Then came the proposal. It was nothing fancy, just us, in our favorite little park. The ring was perfect, simple and elegant, just like I always wanted. I said yes, without skipping a beat. But when we started talking about where we'd live, that's when things got a bit sticky. His mom, Maggie, sweet as she was in her own way, had her own ideas. She wanted us to move in with her. Jack broached the topic gently one evening, while we were cleaning up after dinner in my apartment. Lucy, babe, mom suggested we move in with her. Saves money, and she'd love the company, he said, drying a plate and not quite meeting my eyes. I put down the dish I was washing, water still running. Jack, I love your mom, you know I do. But babe, we need our own space. Just us. He looked conflicted, but nodded. I get it, I really do. It's just. Mom's alone a lot, you know? I turned off the water and leaned against the counter. What if we find a place nearby? That way, we're close, but not too close. She can have us over anytime she wants, but we keep our privacy too. How does that sound? Jack's face brightened. Yeah, that could work. I'll talk to her about it. And so, we compromised. We found a rental not 10 minutes from Maggie's place. It seemed ideal, I figured over time, as we settled into married life, Jack's attachment might shift more towards our little unit. With that in mind, I rented out my apartment and started stashing away the extra income. The move was smoother than I expected. Jack was happy because his mom was just a stone's throw away and I was relieved to maintain some independence. We fell into a comfortable routine, Jack and I commuting to work together most days, coming home to our little sanctuary. But as weeks turned into months, I couldn't shake the feeling that the ties that bound Jack to his mom weren't loosening. Every decision, big or small, seemed to need her stamp of approval. I found myself wondering if our compromise was truly that, or just a temporary fix, to a permanent issue. Life was bustling as usual, my marketing job keeping me on my toes during the day, and the new marital home chores waiting each evening. Things took a sharp turn when Maggie fell sick. It wasn't anything life-threatening, thank goodness, but enough to knock the strength out of her. Lucy, can you check on mom after work? She's really not feeling well. Jack asked one morning as we were rushing out the door, his face lined with worry. Of course, I'll swing by and see what she needs. I replied, squeezing his hand. Little did I know, this would become my new routine. Each evening, I'd go straight from the office, to Maggie's. She had a specific way she liked things done, especially when it came to her meals. I can't eat that reheated stuff, it messes with my stomach, she'd complain if I ever dared suggest cooking enough to last a couple of meals. So, I found myself cooking fresh meals daily, her preferred dishes, that I slowly mastered. After Maggie recovered, I thought my after-work visits would taper off. I couldn't have been more wrong. She'd grown accustomed to the company and the care. 
If anything, her demands increased. Lucy, dear, could you help me with the laundry? And maybe we can order some groceries online, she'd say, her voice always carrying that expectant tone. I did all that and more, picking up her orders, driving her to shops, and every beauty appointment she made. Weekends were no exception. Jack and I spent most of our Saturdays and Sundays at Maggie's, trying to make up for all the family time she missed when Jack's brother cut her off. One particularly exhausting Sunday evening, after a day filled with errands and family gatherings all centered around Maggie's needs, I collapsed on our couch, feeling more like a caretaker than a wife. Jack, we need to talk, I started, my voice heavy with fatigue. I love your mom, but I need some space, some time for us. Jack sat beside me, his expression tense. Lucy, mom's all alone. You know what happened with my brother. I can't just abandon her. She relies on us. I knew about his brother, how he and his wife had moved away, cutting off all contact with Maggie after their wedding. Torn between my need for independence and my husband's loyalty to his mother, I felt isolated. Yet, seeing Jack so earnest, so committed to not repeating his brother's path, I relented. Okay, Jack. We'll keep things as they are for now. I conceded, trying to mask my disappointment. Thank you, babe. I know it's a lot. We'll figure something out, I promise. He said, pulling me into a hug that felt both comforting and confining. As days turned into weeks, my after-work routine remained unchanged. Maggie's house became a second job, one that paid in tired smiles and a sense of duty. My own dreams and desires took a back seat, tucked away like the old novels I no longer had time to read. A year has passed since that conversation, but nothing much had changed. If anything, things got even more intense. Every day after work, my second shift began, cooking, cleaning, running errands for Maggie. By the time I got home each night, I was wiped out. One evening, sprawled on our couch with aching feet propped up, I broached a subject that had been on my mind for a while. Jack, don't you think it's time we think about having our own little family? I asked, trying to sound as casual as possible, despite the butterflies in my stomach. Jack's face lit up, a stark contrast to my tired expression. That's a fantastic idea, babe. Imagine a little one of ours running around. And hey, we could buy a bigger house, move in with mom to help out. What do you think? The thought of living permanently under the same roof as Maggie sent a chill down my spine. I was thinking more along the lines of just us, you know? Just our little family. We can talk about that part later, let's just focus on the baby for now, Jack said quickly, probably sensing my hesitation. I agreed, knowing we needed a serious discussion about boundaries, before anything was set in stone. Despite the unresolved living situation, we told Maggie about our plans to try for a baby. Her smile didn't quite reach her eyes. A baby, huh? That's, wonderful. You two will make great parents. Her tone was flat, and I couldn't help but feel a pang of guilt, wondering if she felt like we were trying to replace her with a new family member but I pushed those thoughts aside, focusing on the future. Months turned into a year, and despite all our hopes and efforts, nothing happened. I followed every health tip I could find, cut out alcohol, ate healthier, hit the gym more. Still, no baby. Worried, I booked an appointment with a specialist to see if something was wrong. Sitting in the sterile clinic, after countless tests, the doctor finally had some answers. It's unusual, Lucy, but your blood work shows elevated levels of a hormone found in birth control pills. Have you been taking any form of contraceptive? I stared at him, bewildered. No, absolutely not. We've been trying to conceive. Why would I take birth control? The doctor looked just as confused as I felt. It's definitely odd. If you're sure about not taking any contraceptives, this shouldn't be happening. Sometimes, prescriptions can get mixed up. I thanked him, my mind racing as I left the clinic. The drive home was a blur. How could this be happening? I'd been so careful with everything, checking and double-checking everything I consumed. Did someone tamper with my medication? 
The idea seemed ludicrous, but desperation and confusion clouded my thoughts. That evening, as per usual, I was at Maggie's house, cleaning up after dinner when I noticed something that made my heart stop. An empty package of birth control pills peeking out from underneath some other trash in the bin. The room spun a little as I pulled it out, examining it. This had to be a mistake. Maggie, can I ask where these came from? I said, holding up the blister pack for her to see. My voice was calm, but inside, I was anything but. Maggie glanced over, her face draining of color as she saw what was in my hand. Oh, those? I, I don't know, must be old. She stammered, looking anywhere but at me. That's funny, because it looks recent. And I just found out I'd been having birth control in my system. Been wondering why we couldn't get pregnant. I said, each word sharper than the last, watching her closely. The air felt heavy, thick with tension as Maggie shifted uncomfortably in her chair. Lucy, you have to understand, I... Understand what, Maggie? That you've been messing with my life? My marriage? The shock was giving way to a burning anger, my voice rising despite my attempt to control it. Maggie sighed, a long, weary sound. It's just, if you had a baby, then you'd stop coming around as much. Jack would stop. I can't lose him too, not like I lost his brother. She confessed, her voice cracking with emotion. So you decided to play God with my body? I was incredulous, feeling the sting of betrayal from someone I had trusted, someone I had cared for. I'm sorry, Lucy. I thought I was protecting my time with my son. That's all. Her apology sounded hollow, doing nothing to cool my anger. I didn't have it in me to argue further. I left her house, a storm of emotions brewing inside me. At home, I waited for Jack, rehearsing the conversation in my head. When he walked through the door, I didn't waste a moment. Your mom has been replacing my vitamins with birth control pills. That's why we couldn't get pregnant. I found the pack in her trash. I blurted it out, the words tasting bitter. Jack froze, his expression one of confusion that slowly morphed into disbelief. Mom? No, she wouldn't. She admitted it, Jack. She did it because she thought we'd stop visiting if we had a baby. After a moment of tense silence, he sighed, running his hands through his hair. Lucy, I know it sounds bad, but, you know mom's been alone a long time. She was just scared. Can't you see that? Please don't be mad at her. Mad? Jack, she violated my body, our trust. How can you just stand there and defend her? I couldn't believe what I was hearing. It felt like the world was upside down. I get it, it's messed up. But she's my mom, Lucy. We can get past this, right? Let's just forget it happened and move on, he said, almost pleading. Forget it happened? As if it were that simple. But I saw in his eyes that arguing would get me nowhere. From that day, I kept a vigilant watch over everything in our home. No more unsupervised visits to the medicine cabinet for Maggie. Two months later, despite the odds, I found out I was pregnant. The joy was tempered by caution, given the recent betrayal. When we told Maggie, her reaction was as cold as ice. That's nice, she said flatly, then immediately asked about dinner plans as if nothing significant had been shared. Prepping for the birth of my baby became my new project as intense as any marketing campaign I'd ever run. I signed up for prenatal classes, eager to learn everything I could about bringing my baby into the world as naturally as possible. Yet every class was a sharp reminder of my solo journey, couples filled the room, hands entwined, while I sat alone, my chair next to me painfully empty. Jack made excuses for every session. Babe, you know I've got so much on at work, and mom needs me tonight. Or, I'm just not up for it. You know how these things make me feel. It was always something. Feeling more and more isolated, I threw myself into planning for the birth. I chose a clinic specializing in natural water births, located outside the city, known for its serene environment and expert care. It wasn't cheap, but I had been saving every penny from the rental income of my apartment. 
This was about bringing my baby safely and peacefully into the world, and I wasn't going to cut corners. One evening, while dining at Maggie's, the conversation inevitably turned to finances. You know, Lucy, I heard those birthing centers cost a fortune. Why waste money when the hospital here does just fine? Maggie said, her tone more accusing than curious. I took a deep breath, trying to keep the irritation from my voice. It's not a waste if it ensures the health and safety of your grandchild, Maggie. I've got it covered. Jack, who had been half listening, suddenly tuned in. Covered? How's that? Well, I've got a reserve account from the apartment rental. It's more than enough to cover the costs, I explained, a bit reluctantly. Maggie's eyes sharpened, her interest visibly peaked. Oh, you've been saving up? That's good foresight. I nodded, feeling their gaze heavy on me, knowing I might have disclosed too much. Quickly, I steered the conversation elsewhere, discussing potential baby names to divert their focus. Despite the ongoing stress, I continued my solo visits to the prenatal classes, each time returning a little more empowered but also a little lonelier. The clinic staff was supportive, and I often stayed back to ask questions about the birth process. Each visit made me more certain of my decision, this was the right place for my baby to come into the world. With the countdown to motherhood ticking ever louder, I decided a short trip to visit my parents in their city was just what I needed. It had been too long since I had surrounded myself with family who were nothing but supportive and loving, a stark contrast to the tense atmosphere back home. My heart felt lighter as I caught up with old school friends and spent precious moments with my grandmother, promising her that my son would bear the name of my late grandfather. But barely a day into my visit, my phone buzzed with a call from Jack, his voice edged with urgency. Lucy, you need to come back. Now. Panic surged through me. What's happened? Is everything okay? Just come back, okay? It's important he pressed, hanging up before I could probe further. Worried and confused, I packed up and headed back, my mind racing with possibilities of what could demand such an abrupt end to my visit. As I opened the front door of our home, the sight that greeted me sucked the air right out of my lungs. The house was a disaster zone, empty bottles, pizza boxes strewn across the floor, sticky stains marking the tiles. It looked like the aftermath of a wild party. Jack, smelling of booze and barely standing straight, waved a hand dismissively at the mess. I threw a bash to celebrate the baby coming. Clean this up, will ya? I can't stand the mess. I stared at him, disbelief and anger swirling inside me. You called me back for this? To clean up your party? Why couldn't you handle it? He shrugged, a sloppy grin on his face. Come on, Lucy. Don't be like that. It was a party for our kid. A party that I wasn't even here for, I snapped back, my energy draining just thinking about the cleanup ahead. With a heavy heart, I started cleaning. Jack had already stumbled to our room, leaving me to deal with the chaos alone. The physical strain of bending, lifting, and scrubbing was immense, especially being so far along in my pregnancy. By the time I finished, my body ached, and I felt contractions starting, a sharp reminder that the baby was almost here. The next morning, labor kicked in full force. Alone and scared, I called a taxi to take me to the clinic. Jack, barely awake and nursing a hangover, mumbled something about meeting me there later. At the clinic, surrounded by medical staff, but devoid of the emotional support I so desperately needed, I gave birth to a beautiful baby boy. The pain of labor paled in comparison to the ache in my heart from doing it without Jack by my side. He showed up hours later, his congratulations feeling hollow and forced. I'm here now, huh? Let's just focus on the little guy, he said, avoiding my eyes. The coldness in his voice stung, but nothing hurt more than Maggie's reaction, or lack thereof. When I called her with the news, her response was curt. A baby shouldn't be shown off until he's at least a month old. Keeps away the bad vibes. Her words, so devoid of warmth, didn't surprise me as much as they should have. In a way, I was relieved. No visits from her meant one less thing to worry about. After what felt like an eternity, I finally brought my baby boy home from the clinic. 
The quiet of the house was a stark contrast to the chaotic events of the past few weeks. Despite the calm, an undercurrent of tension lingered, especially with Jack's nonchalant revelation that his mother had taken off on a vacation. A few days into adjusting to motherhood, I received the clinic bill. My heart sank when I saw the balance due, $5,000 more than what the insurance covered. Confident about my financial backup, I logged into my account to transfer the funds, only to find the balance shockingly low. Way below what should have been over $50,000. Panic set in, my breaths quick and shallow. Dialing Jack with trembling hands, I braced for his explanation. Jack, there's hardly any money left in the reserve account. What happened? His reply was casual, dismissive almost. Oh, yeah, mom needed some cash for her vacation. You know, to unwind and all. Jack, are you telling me you gave our savings, over $40,000, to your mother? It's our son's future, Jack. How could you? My voice rose, a mix of disbelief and rising anger. Babe, come on. You're blowing this out of proportion. And anyway, you stopped cleaning up at mom's place, she's tired. She deserves some fun, he retorted. That was the final straw. His words echoed in my ears, each one chipping away at the last vestiges of patience I had for this marriage. By evening, I was sitting in front of a lawyer, divorce papers spread out in front of me. When Jack saw the papers, his reaction was not what I expected. No anger, no sadness, just a resigned, almost relieved. All right then. He signed them with a steady hand, grabbed his coat, and left without another word, heading straight to his mother's place. Feeling a mix of liberation and deep sorrow, I decided it was time for me and my son to leave, at least for a while. We went to my parents' house, where I was greeted with warm hugs and soothing words, a stark contrast to the coldness of my now-strained marriage. Lucy, you need to talk to Jack's brother, my dad suggested one evening. He went through something similar with Maggie. Hesitant but curious, I reached out to Jack's estranged brother. The conversation that unfolded was eye-opening. He told me about how Maggie had tried to control his wife's inheritance, how it tore their marriage apart until he chose his wife over his mother. Maggie had cut all ties with him in retaliation. Lucy, she won't change. I learned that the hard way. You've got to look out for yourself and your kid, he advised, his voice heavy with the weight of experience. Hanging up, I felt a mix of emotions swirling inside me. Jack had chosen his mother over our family, just as his brother warned might happen. The realization was painful but clear. The final straw had been pulled, the last line crossed. I stood in the police station, a mix of resolve and nervous energy swirling through me as I detailed everything to the officer on duty. My voice was steady, though my hands trembled slightly. My husband transferred money from my account without my knowledge, and I believe he forged my signature to do it. Over the following weeks, a full investigation unfolded. It revealed not only had Jack forged my signature, but he had also given his mother access to the funds. The evidence was undeniable, and eventually, both were charged. In court, Jack's face was unreadable as the judge handed down their sentences, both received suspended sentences for their crimes. Jack was also ordered to pay alimony for our son, ensuring at least some financial stability for our future. I reached out to the family of Jack's brother, driven by the conversation I had with him. They welcomed me with open arms. It turned out they were nothing like the monsters Maggie had painted them to be. Their warmth and acceptance were a soothing balm to the wounds left by my former in-laws. One sunny Saturday afternoon, as our children played together in the backyard, Jack's brother, Mike, threw a couple of steaks on the grill, and his wife, Sarah, handed me a chilled glass of lemonade. Lucy, we're just glad you reached out. Mom, she can spin quite the tale, Mike said flipping the steaks with a practiced flick of his wrist. Watching Danny laugh as he chased after his cousins, a sense of peace settled over me. Thank you, both. It means the world to us to have family like you. As the kids tumbled around, their laughter filling the air, Mike leaned over and said in a conspiratorial tone, You know, mom always did like to be the center of the universe. But around here, it's just simple family life. No drama. 
Exactly what we need, I responded, smiling at the simple truth in his words. Our gatherings became a regular thing, our children bonding as cousins do, forming connections that promised to last a lifetime. The holidays were particularly full of joy, the kids' excitement contagious, making each moment a bit brighter.